Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, you're used to Pastor um, coming up here and being able to just be led by the Spirit, and now you've got me. <laughs> so I, um, I wrote it out um, so I could focus on what I want to say. Um, when Pastor asked us to address you this morning and to share about our recent journey through Austin's medical emergency, we agreed with the sole intention of sharing about how God has been so vividly active in our lives as of late and how he deserves all glory. God is at the very center of this story and he is the only one we wish to recognize as the perfecter of this event. All honor and praise go to him alone. As Psalm 9-1 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. On Friday night, October 13th, our lives changed forever as our son Austin faced death, but was miraculously saved by the grace and mercy of God. As many of you know, Austin, who was 17 years old and a senior at Spencer High School, suffered a cardiac arrest as he was about to get into his car following a football game in Storm Lake. He has previously been healthy to our knowledge and had been feeling well all through the game. The rescuing hand of God becomes clearly visible as you listen to how the story unfolds. Austin was ready to get into his car when he fell down unresponsive. His friend Sam, a passenger in his car and a lifeguard who has had emergency training, immediately called 911 after seeing that he was struggling to breathe and turning blue. Help came within minutes to, became, to begin life-saving CPR. Police were close because they were at the game. Emergency trained professionals and lay people were right there at the perfect time to administer effective CPR. Amazingly, Spencer Hospital's nurse anesthetist, Dale Kroll, happened to go to the game that night. In addition, he had told me that he was going to take a different route, um, but when he left the parking lot, he had driven down a dead-end road and then turned around. He was going to go a different way to avoid traffic, but then decided to go down the path where Austin was lying on the ground, struggling to breathe. He came upon him at just the perfect time and was able to take control of the situation. Jason Holt is here a teacher at Spencer High School, came upon the scene and began chest compressions after assessing that Austin had no pulse, it wasn't breathing. The ambulance arrived quickly, as did Storm Lake Police and even an off-duty paramedic who was at the game to pick up his son. Dale was able to secure an air airway through a nasotracheal tube, which is more difficult to properly place because Austin's teeth were clenched, making normal intubation impossible. Later in the ICU, the doctor was amazed at the perfect placement of the airway. I smiled and answered that God had clearly provided that also. An AED was quickly available and delivered a shock. Paramedics also placed an IO needle, which is short for interosseous access. And what it is, it's a large bore needle that is inserted directly into the bone marrow to give medications, where time is of the essence. In this case, they wanted to get medicine in quickly without the time necessary to start an IV, and therefore used IO access in the tibia bone right below Austin's knee. Through this site, they were able to administer a do dose of epinephrine. These measures brought Austin's heart rhythm out of the life-threatening arrhythmia that his heart was in. He would have died without intervention. If Austin had arrested just a few minutes later, he would have been driving with friends in the car. If the arrest had occurred when he was alone, no one would have been there to help him. Any of us could have happened upon him dead. Although the doctors believe that Austin was born with this genetic heart defect, the cardiac arrest happened at just the perfect time and just the perfect place where he was able to be successfully resuscitated. I clearly see the hand of God. 
One of the sweetest visuals that I have was reported to me by onlookers at the football field. They reported that Austin's friends stood in a circle off to the side praying for him and for those that were working to save his life. A group of high school students stood in the gap for my son immediately. My girlfriend later shared an analogy with me that she had once heard about standing in, in um, prayer for others and the game-changing impact it has on the big scheme of things. As she shared, it involves the pawn piece in the game of chess. While the pawn has no power to make significant moves on the chessboard, it does have the power to stand on a spot or territory and hold it. Ultimately, that piece, as insignificant as it might seem, can prevent the enemy from making key advances in the game. And this is what a believer in Jesus must do, play the pawn through, through prayer. Praying may not seem impactful at the moment. You may not know exactly what to pray, and you may not recognize an immediate shift in the game, but prayer is vital, and it will alter the course of the situation through the release of God's mighty power. These kids stood in the gap at that moment, and they didn't quit either. They prayed for him and with him for days following, as did so many others. One of the impactful verses that was shared with me over and over was from Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you while you keep still. I struggled to do this, but it became so clear that God was at work around me and I needed to still my heart and my mind eventually in order to see him. We were notified of Austin's collapse by one of his friends who was there with him at the game, our neighbor boy, Trey. He called me to tell, him, tell me to come immediately that Austin had collapsed. I didn't understand. I thought Austin had fainted. But Trey began crying, saying, no, you don't understand. They're doing chest compressions. He tried to describe to me what was happening until he was able to hand the phone to Jason Holt, who had been relieved by the paramedics. Jason calmly told me what was happening, and I tried to focus on what he was describing. The hardest thing I've ever had to do was to listen to people administering CPR to my son over the phone. When I didn't know what to do, I simply cried, Jesus. Jason was finally able to report that they had recovered a pulse and were taking him by ambulance to the BB County Hospital. Then I had to hang up and continue speeding to Storm Lake, all the while not knowing what was happening. It was really yucky. We prayed as we drove, and my sweet Abby, who had sat quietly in the back seat listening to me on the phone, finally spoke up and quietly encouraged, Mom, I learned in chapel that God has a plan for our lives. He has a special plan for Austin's life, and I can feel it in my gut that he's going to be okay. Oh, the faith of a child. <laughs> it's beautiful. And she maintained that position all the way through this whole ordeal. Complete trust in God's plan. How I envied that piece. I thought about that often in these past few weeks. What an amazing testimony she displayed. A childlike faith with sincere trust that God has got us in the palm of his hand no matter what happens. Austin was airlifted by helicopter to Sanford Children's Hospital in Sioux Falls after he had a negative head CT where they worked to stabilize him. No clear reason was initially identified as to the cause of his arrest. Austin was reintubated in Sioux Falls with an oral endotracheal tube, and I was able to view the video of the procedure, and I was taken aback by the thick, gelatinous secretions that were present in his airway. His doctor believed it was, a, was due to a combination of atelectasis and aspiration, both of which resulted from chest compressions. Atelectasis is a process of inadequate lung volume in the little air sacs that are in your lung. Part of that lung becomes airless and then it, it collapses. The compression 
and the lack of normal oxygenation that occurred during CPR caused areas of Austin's lung to become unable to properly exchange air. In addition, the doctors felt that he most likely aspirated stomach contents into his lungs during chest compressions. Lung tissue is extremely sensitive to foreign fluids, and so this all contributed to his lung issues. His chest x-ray showed congestion, inflammation, pleural effusions or fluid in the bases of his lung, and a completely mucus-filled right upper lobe of his lung. Ultimately, Austin developed a pneumothorax, or a collapsed lung, in the upper portion on this right side, and it required a chest tube to be placed. During all of this, the doctors kept him very sedated to allow his hung lungs to heal so he could breathe again on his own. They also induced hypothermia to protect his heart and his brain from working harder, particularly as he then developed a fever. After that, he, he sh began shivering uncontrollably, and then they had to work to control that. My mind raced at this point. I felt like I was riding an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Initially scared that he was going to die at the field, then so relieved that he had been resuscitated, then scared to death about how long his brain had been deprived of oxygen and what that would mean for his long-term survival, then relieved as the helicopter crew reported a few purposeful movements on the way to Sioux Falls, then terrified as I observed how much his body was struggling to maintain oxygen levels. The emotional ride was exhausting. I have a medical background but this was all new territory for me. I knew just enough to be dangerously horrified at what I saw. My prayers were e equally vacillating, up and down, wavering between prayers of thanks and prayers of begging for mercy. Struggling to keep my heart still, I thanked God for saving us in his life as I could clearly see how he had intervened to bring him this far. But then my hope quickly faded as I struggled to understand why God would save him only for me to watch him die. In hindsight now, I can see that wasn't going to be the case. Austin wasn't going to die. I believe that the struggle was meant as a witness for all those who surrounded Austin, both there in the hospital and beyond, to point people to Christ. In the process, I also got a front row seat and drank from the proverbial fire hydrant of truth being blasted at me. While I still wish that Austin didn't have to live with a chronic disease and an unknown future, I am grateful now for the opportunity to see God at work, responsive and merciful to me, an undeserving sinner. I feel a deeper level of trust and faith in his plan for his people. I would still feel a stabbing pain and cry out in agony if something happens to my babies. But I know that God is there. He loves us and he has a perfect will. There are things that are worse than dying, namely not knowing Jesus as your personal savior and only path to eternal life. But living in fear, living without faith that God has a plan, and living without recognizing God's sovereignty are also no way to live. I listened intently as they talked about how to treat Austin. His intensivist physician spoke of ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. I searched the corridor, corridors of my brain to remember what I knew about that diagnosis, and all I could recall is that it had a poor prognosis. The doctor switched his ventilator to an oscillating type called a bronchotron in an attempt to clear the secretions in his lungs. They spoke of flipping him over onto his stomach to try to release the secretions. At the same time, I watched them adjusting his ventilator set settings in an effort to increase oxygenation. I was teetering on complete desperation at this point. My stomach fell and I felt the deepest searing pain imaginable. I went to an empty room and I sobbed uncontrollably. I wanted to completely trust Jesus, but to be honest, at that moment I was filled with despair and even anger. I kept crying out, why? I just want my baby back. I knew that Jesus was my only hope, but I was agonizingly battling to find the words to pray for my son. As I reflect back on those dark moments, I remember the excruciating dilemma of wanting to pray, but not for God's will, 
if it meant losing my son. I felt extreme guilt and shame as I realized that I didn't want to pray for God's will to be done and I didn't want to accept his will when I didn't think it was aligning with my own. I didn't even know how to pray at that time. Although I was at my darkest place, I did know without any doubt that if Austin died, he would be with Jesus. And that gave me comfort. I have that now to hang on to as I've been wrestling through my lack of trust issues with God. I know that when I hit rock bottom, I still had hope in Jesus Christ, my Savior. And that brings me incredible peace. This is the time when I became aware of tremendous prayers being sent to the throne room of God on Austin's behalf. You held a prayer vigil here, and so many others sent all kinds of prayers and petitions asking God to move. Friends, family, and people that we've never met literally fell on their knees with us. I alluded to this before, but this is when I felt my arms being lifted up to heaven by others. I was absolutely weary. My faith family supported me. However, to, by lifting my son up to God, laying him at the feet of Jesus. It was then that Austin's condition began to stabilize, and I felt an overwhelming sense of his presence. 2 Samuel 22.7 says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. One of the precious kisses from God was also seeing brothers and sisters in Christ from all denominations coming together to petition God. While denominal, denominational differences are important to our worship, God's church with his family of believers is bigger and more important than of any divisional issues. We come together under God, recognizing Jesus as our savior, collectively believing in his saving grace. How beautiful is that? As I still worked to still my heart, I really saw God working for me, and it wasn't just because Austin was doing better. I saw God working all around me, changing hearts and drawing people to himself. God was doing all of the work as his people were obedient to him. I have had many conversations since this event that have been difficult and have allowed me to really grow with God. Several of these have been with parents whose children did not survive sharing their deep pain about not having their prayers answered as they have hoped. Some have truly struggled to understand God's purpose. One grieving parent said to me, we prayed that our child would be saved to no avail. Maybe we didn't pray hard enough or we didn't have enough faith. That breaks my heart and honestly makes me feel some survivor's guilt. So I've spent some significant time rolling this over with God. And while I certainly do not have a complete understanding of why God moves when he does and why he chooses the timing he does, I do know that God is sovereign and has all authority. It's a good thing he does, too, is his plan is far superior and, in fact, perfect. I must learn to trust his plan even when it hurts so deeply that I am grieved. God's lens is an eternal one with a much broader scope than our limited earthly view. We know that we're going to die. From dust we came and to dust we will return. God determines our days and that is his right. I believe that prayer can change things, but God doesn't change his mind. If God's plan is always perfect, then he would never need to veer from it. So if we can't change God's mind, why do we pray? 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. I think the important part of this passage is according to his will. It was God's will that Austin live yet, but the prayers altered the course of his illness. We all witness God moving in dynamic and clearly visible ways through this. So what was the outcome of the prayer vigil for Austin? 
As Dr. David Jeremiah proclaims, it was the same outcome as every prayer vigil should have. God's people entering into right relationship with him so that his plans and purposes can be carried out through us. Psalm 62, verses 5 and 6 speaks of waiting. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. It seems to me that God can respond in one of three ways when he considers our prayer. Number one, he can answer yes. Number two, he can answer no. Or three, he can say, not now, you must wait. Waiting is hard, especially when you don't understand the plan and life seems to have stopped. On Sunday, we experienced relief from the weight of knowing about Austin's brain activity, seeing him respond to us for the first time since the cardiac arrest. In particular, after waiting for days for a sign, it was a beautiful moment of answered prayer when we could see that he was really in there. The concern about oxygen deprivation to his brain melted away as he regained consciousness. He was scared, and tears fell down his cheeks as he struggled to understand where he was and what had happened. The nurses stood at his bedside with us and waited while he tried to communicate with us. Finally, he was able to sign, I love you. That was my most precious moment of all. He was extubated and was doing well until his oxygen saturations began to fall toward evening. He was struggling to breathe and necessitated the use of CPAP, which forced a high volume of oxygen into his lungs. Austin had a really hard time trying to not fight against it and had to be sedated again. I sat by his side for several hours and coached him to breathe slowly and deeply. I instructed him to use his breathing exercises from choir. <laughs> <laughs> and he responded, <laughs> listens to his teacher more than his mother. His heart became quite irritable with the strain of his labored breathing, and we all became very concerned about the rhythms that we were seeing on the monitor. Iowa City was called and a medical drip was started that calmed his heart rhythm. Early the next morning, Austin and I flew by airplane to Iowa City where his condition stabilized. He underwent a cardiac MRI where a diagnosis of left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy was made, a genetic heart disease where the bottom of his left ventricle didn't develop correctly and instead remained spongy or trabeculated, as they call it. Cardiac arrest isn't that common with this diagnosis, but it's how it presented for Austin. Because there is no cure, Austin had an implantable cardioverting defibrillator, or ICD, placed that can shock his heart if it ever rests again. It's a device that has a lead that goes into his left ventricle, and it has a compressor with a computer and a battery, and the battery has to be changed every 10 years. And Austin will have echocardiograms done every six months for the rest of his life to watch for any worsening condition of his heart function. If someday his heart doesn't squeeze like it should, more medicines can be added, External devices could be tried, and ultimately a heart transplant could be performed. We have spent time talking about why me, but decided that the correct question is rather, why not me? I certainly don't, Austin, don't want Austin to have a heart condition, but I understand that God created Austin perfectly to use him at this time as a light for others to see Christ. We live in a fallen world and expect hardship. Life isn't fair, and we can't expect it to be. But blessed be the name of the Lord. God used Austin's sick heart to show others his love and his willingness to answer prayer. The future is unknown for Austin and for all of us, really. We don't know when our time will be up. But I know that every day is an opportunity to do the best we can with the gifts that we are given. We are adjusting to living with the chronic medical, medical condition now. As the attention dissipates, we have had to accept the reality that life will never be the same. Satan wants us to feel self-pity about that reality. He wants us to feel alone and bitter. But we have discussed how this diagnosis is not Austin's identity. He has so many gifts and talents, personality and charm, and he is God's instrument who can point others to Christ, as we all can. 
It's not about sulking in what we can't control. It's about embracing our purpose here on earth and being assured of where we're going after we leave here. I thought about how trying to force my will can be compared to putting a puzzle together. If I tried to force my piece into a space where it doesn't fit, it would ruin the whole puzzle. The overall picture wouldn't be right, and the other pieces would be off because I squeezed into the wrong spot. God is the only one who can make all the pieces fit perfectly to assemble a beautiful puzzle, a perfect plan for his people. God used Austin's experience to reach so many people in only a way that he could orchestrate. I've received messages from all over the world. For instance, a young Vietnamese man who Ryan ministered to during his mission trip this summer sent me a prayer. Think about that. Wow. A young man that we prayed would come to know Christ now offered our son prayers of healing through Christ. That's beautiful. And that's a tapestry that only God could weave. I also have had discussions with several parents via social media who are struggling with significant medical issues. One of these is a single mother from New York City whose son has the same diagnosis as Austin, although more advanced. She has a language barrier and was struggling to explain her son's disease to her family. She was able to copy and paste my words to her page for her support system to read. And in turn, she and her family have been praying for Austin. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be supports for each other. In another situation, I had the privilege of speaking to a woman who hasn't been able to bring herself to attend church because of pent-up anger that she has held against God, following significant loss of people in her life. She had read of my struggle with feelings of anger and despair, and we were able to talk about how God is thankfully big enough to handle our emotions, and he is ready to receive us back into his arms where he can free us from the place where Satan would like us to stay. What is so very cool about what we have witnessed is that God used a moment in our lives to show his glory and made the event all about him. See, it isn't about us. God doesn't love us any more than he loves anyone else. It's all about his glory, his will, and his ability to draw others to him. It's miraculous, it's overwhelming, and it's intoxicating as we long to see him do more. My mind drifted to several biblical mothers as I was grieving over this situation. I thought of both Mary and Hannah. Mary, the mother of Jesus, rejoiced when she was called to be a mother in a very difficult way. She was shunned and her son rejected. And then she experienced the most unbelievable pain watching her son's torture and death. I wonder if she understood God's plan as she most certainly prayed for her son. What conflict I feel when I think of the love she obviously had for her child alongside the desire to honor God in completing the task to which she had been called. Hannah wanted a son so badly and was even bullied by her husband's other wife because of her barrenness. When she became pregnant, she too worshiped God and rejoiced in a prayer that is strikingly similar to Mary's prayer, even though she knew she would have to give him over to God to be raised in the temple. Feeling emotions of thanksgiving and praise to God when these mothers knew their sons had been called to leave them is a biblical example of how to love and honor God above all things and how to entrust my children completely to God's care. One of the most precious memories and moments for me when, was when Pastor Wendy Van Tassel visited Austin while she was near Iowa City. She sang to Austin at his bedside singing the Sabbath prayer from Fiddler on the Roof, which is the musical that Spencer High School was performing very soon and Austin was to be a part of. In the musical, the parents sing the prayer over their children. May the Lord protect and defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor him, O Lord, with happiness and peace. O oh, hear our Sabbath prayer, amen. At the time, it was unknown if Austin would be able to return to this fall musical when it was to be performed two weeks later. We cried as we pondered that possibility, coupled with the beauty of the lyrics and the blessing of how far Austin had come. 
Miraculously, he did return to the stage, and as I watched him sing this same Sabbath prayer up on stage, a mere two weeks after his chest tube was pulled, I was overwhelmed by the sense of God's presence. I felt as if he was whispering to me, see, trust me, I am in control, and I have shown you my rich love, my glorious splendor, my almighty sovereignty. No matter what happens, I remain faithful and steadfast. I fulfill my promises, and I have a better plan. I have saved your son and all who believe in mine for all eternity. God took my breath away, and I am in total awe of his majesty. All glory and honor are his. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, I want to start with um, what I remember from that night. Um, on Friday, the last thing I remember is going to my car. Um, I even remember I was drinking a Mountain Dew, and I set it on top of my car. Um, and I opened the door, and that was the last thing I remember. Um, and then after that, I don't remember anything until Monday when I was in Iowa City Hospital. Um, I woke up very confused, um, very conflicted, um, scared. And I sat down with my mom, and we talked about what had happened. And my first feeling was of, like, why me? This is not fair, um, God. Why do you do things like this? Um, but after talking with my mom, the first thing I did was open up my phone. And I looked on there, and I saw the support from everyone. I saw about the prayer vigil, and all my friends at school were in cyclone colors. Um, Many people had reached out to me, texted me, and even my friends had contacted some of the Iowa State players, um, Alan Lazard, who had an amazing game on Saturday, <laughs> um, Monte Morris, and even the Iowa governor. Um, so that was so special. And it really lifted me up and made me feel like everything was going to be okay. And so after that, my, me and my mom talked about how many people had seen God through me and how my story um, could teach them to come to God. And I thought that everything was going to be okay, and that if even a couple people could learn God through me, that it was all right. But then on Wednesday, um, after hearing the news of my condition, um, all that went away, and I felt angry again, and like it was unfair. The whole time I was hoping that my diagnosis would be that they could fix it and everything would be back to normal, and that's all that I wanted. Um, but now I have to live with these differences. But I can still see how people have been got, brought to God through me, and that is so special. In Iowa City, I would walk around the hospital and see other kids who have it so much worse than me, um, kids who have been there for months and months and months, and I knew that I was going to be okay. And my family was just amazing to me, the prayers that they gave, and everyone else, <clears throat> um, they have helped me learn to accept it. Um, God chose me to save me, and I think it's because he has a purpose for my life. And I don't know what that purpose is, but I want to serve him and do that purpose. Through this whole thing, I believe that I have come much, much closer to God. Um, just, I think it's just thinking about him more thinking about how life is precious and anyone can be taken away at any time and that knowing God as your Savior is the most important thing in life. And what I want with the rest of my life is to be able to help people with that and help people know God. Thank you. At first... I wasn't going to come up and speak today. Number one, I'm not a particularly emotional person and never feel compelled to express my feelings. You can ask my poor wife if you don't believe me. <laughs> Number two, I'm certainly not qualified to offer any great spiritual guidance or to help you understand the Bible or God's will. But people convince me 
that some of my experience and how I dealt with the situation could help others. And like Andrea said, you know, it's our 15 minutes of fame, so let's use this time. All right, I said that. So let's use this time to show how our experience is tied with God. So my Christian up, upbringing and background plays a great role to who I am, and especially how I dealt with this particular situation. I was brought up, things were always black and white, and we didn't focus on the gray area. We get what, what God gives us and make the best of it, good or bad. If you are blessed, you share, and if you don't get blessed, then you don't complain. My grandma was probably one of the most staunch Christians I knew, and she was unwavering in her faith. And she didn't like us to complain. So if we complained in the house, and one of my cousins is here, and she can corroborate these stories. And, and mind you, my complaints and grandma's idea of a complaint were two different things. You know, when I stated it was cold out, that's a statement. To grandma, it's a complaint. So off we went into the guest room to read the book of Job. And after reading the book of Job, Grandma would quiz us on the book of Job to make sure we fully understood it, and if she wasn't satisfied, back in the room to read the book of Job. <laughs> so <clears throat> the point is, is, is no matter how bad you think you have it, somebody always does have it worse. We had some folks here that took a mission trip recently, and I can guarantee you, I'm sure they witnessed this firsthand. The night uh, we got that phone call, I was more fortunate than my wife because I was driving. I called 911 and I told them we'll be driving a white Ford Expedition and my son just went on a cardiac arrest in Storm Lake and I probably wouldn't pull over if they tried to pull me over. So just go to the hospital and wait for me. You can give me my ticket when I get there. <laughs> so I got the focus on driving. I didn't worry about anything else. I noticed Abby was was with us. She was in the back seat, and, and it was quite a stressful situation. So we prayed, and we prayed together, and, and we promised to leave whatever happened in God's hands. And at that point, I truly accepted that Austin's fate had already been decided by God. Whether I show up there, and he's dead or he's alive, it's already been decided. So at that point... The only thing I had control of was our vehicle and my actions, how I behaved. So we, I focused on that. Tried not to worry about, uh, you know, what was going to happen when I got there. I worried that what would happen to my wife and my daughter when we showed up and if Austin was dead. Fortunately, when we got there, he was stable. They stabilized him, put him on the helicopter. He went to uh, the ICU in Stanford. We got there. It was an incredibly uh, great facility. The doctors were good. My wife has an extensive medical background, so I just stayed out of the way. <laughs> they have all the medical talk. You know, when I, every time I tried to bring something up or ask a question, you know, the term contraption is not in the medical terminology. So. <laughs> to not look stupid, I just I stayed away and I trusted my wife and I trusted the doctors. And I trusted that God was watching over us. So I, you know, we had plenty of visitors and and I had plenty of things to do to keep keep busy and keep my mind off of it. So and the best advice that we got when we were up there was from a doctor and she sat us down and and this was when times were the worst. And she said, <clears throat> your life is, is, is now in hour increments. You, you live through this hour, you get to the next one. And you don't look back, you don't look forward. So with all the things that was going on with Austin's health, there was always a, a positive to look at. I mean, he survived this hour, he's moving into the next one, you know. So that was the thing. At that point, I decided to try to focus on the positives. And <clears throat> there's always a little bit of good news, and we try to focus on that. And then I saw everybody's prayers, and 
the visitors we had, and how the whole community was rallying behind this. And that made it easier for me to, to, to uh, do you know, what I was supposed to do. So in, in, in summary, um, we need to take what God gives us and make the best of it, good or bad. We need to understand that he's in complete control. And we need to worry about what we can control and trust God and others for the rest. And when life gets really tough, take things in small increments and focus on the positives. And I'm not saying I pulled this off flawlessly. Again, I defer to my wife if you don't believe me. <laughs> but in closing, I want to tell everyone how proud <clears throat> I am of Austin and how well he handled himself in this crisis and how well he's handled the situation now. I never once heard, why me or poor me? He is not just acting like a man through this. He is acting like a man of God. And I want to thank everybody that supported us and prayed for us and for the free T-shirt. <laughs> <clears throat> but most of all, <clears throat> I want to thank Jesus Christ, our almighty Savior, for dying on the cross because no matter what happens to Austin or any of my other family or anybody here in this congregation, as long as we all believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior, we will meet again in heaven. Because what happens on this earth is not all that important. Thank you.